In previous lessons, we've looked at orchestrating piano music, as well as orchestrating from sketches. In both these situations, the orchestration's ultimate goal is to fully realize what may be only implicit in the more modest versions, making the musical character as strong as possible. In this lesson, we'll look at the opposite process, reducing an orchestral score, for example, for piano. This process has both practical and theoretical reasons for existing. First, we should remember that before the 20th century, which saw the arrival of radio, television, high-quality recordings, and the internet, you couldn't listen to your favorite music, or any music, unless somebody was playing it in your presence. If you loved Wagner operas but didn't live in a major city, you would never have had a chance to hear them. And even if you did live in a major center, they had other repertoire to present, and your favorite opera might not be on the program. This problem had a possible and modest solution playing the music in a reduction, say for piano or for a small ensemble. This still required knowing some musicians, but it's much easier to find a decent pianist than to have a whole orchestra at your service. And indeed, often social evenings featured a pianist giving a home concert, playing music for small groups of people. Amateur musicians also played their favorite music often from such reductions themselves. Famous pianists like Liszt often played reductions of larger works in their concerts. Of course, a reduction by Liszt could be a lot more difficult to play than one designed for musical amateurs, but the purpose was the same, to provide access to music that was otherwise unavailable. Another quite different situation requiring orchestral reductions, and it's still relevant today, is when preparing soloists for a performance. When a violinist is learning, say, the Sibelius Violin Concerto, they cannot practice for hours on end with an orchestra. Normally, they'll first practice with a pianist who plays a reduction of the orchestra part, so that when they finally do get to play with the orchestra, they're already familiar with the music. This saves many hours of orchestra rehearsal time and, of course, lots of money. For our purposes, apart from their historical interest, reductions can also be a useful pedagogical tool. Making a reduction forces you to really think about the purpose and the role of each element in the musical score. Since reduction, by definition, means leaving things out, the big question becomes, what can we leave out without ruining the musical character? In an earlier lesson, we already mentioned that when making an orchestral version of a piano piece, one needs to actually write the pedal resonance into the orchestra, adding sustained notes on neutral pitches. Working the other way around, I and mean, reducing an orchestra piece for piano, there's no need to transcribe those resonance notes, the pedal will do their job. This is an example of the way you need to think when transcribing. You have to understand the musical reasons for the composer's decisions in order to translate them meaningfully. Once you understand why the composer did something in the first place, it's easier to decide how essential it is to reduction or not. Let's look at an example from Mozart, the beginning of the G minor symphony, K550. Here are the first few bars of the orchestral score, then two different piano reductions. The first is by Hummel and the second is by Power. As you might expect, both reductions preserve the melody as is. They also both preserve the bass line, but the reduction by power preserves the octave shifts of the original. Notice that both reductions eliminate the second violin doubling of the melody. When moving doublings, it's important to ask yourself which one is the real line and which one is the added doubling. In this case, the main line is clearly the top one. In fact, playing the lower octave alone would just confuse it with the accompaniment. Why not keep both octaves? Well, the purpose of the doubling in the orchestration is simply to give the melody a richer sound. In the piano, however, it would interfere with the accompaniment figuration. Another common element in both versions is that they change the accompaniment figuration. The repeated note figure in the strings is easy for them, but at this speed for the piano it's much harder, more virtuoso. Since the main purpose of the accompaniment is usually to provide motion and harmonic fullness, Changing it into easier arpeggio figuration makes sense. Note that the two reductions don't reduce the accompaniment in exactly the same way. This is a minor point, as long as the accompaniment figuration is consistent, using the same motive and rhythmic values throughout the whole passage. Changing motives in midstream would distract the listener's attention. Now look at measure 10. Here, for the first time, the orchestra has sustained sound in the cellos and basses. On the piano, this will translate into using the pedal more generously. In both piano versions, the low bass notes are now notated as whole notes, 
but the spacing of the accompaniment is different. The homo version transposes it lower, making it easier to sustain the left hand low notes. It's higher in the power version, in the same register as in the original. Another interesting point is that both piano reductions here have the melody in octaves for the first time. Why? Well, since the articulation is now smoother, more legato, the sound is fuller, so playing the right hand in octaves helps to achieve that on the piano. Now let's look at measure 14. Here the texture is quite different. The main line is in the woodwind, doubled in three octaves, while the strings have sustained harmony. It would be very awkward for the pianist to play all the notes here with all the doublings. In addition, there are really two planes of tone, winds and strings here, which the orchestration keeps distinct. So this requires some rethinking. The left hand can play the bass and the little counterpoint in the viola. Note, however, that the lower octave, the double bass part, has to be ignored. The right hand can play the woodwind line, although not in three octaves. The homo reduction starts the woodwind line doubled in octaves, but then abandons the doubling in measure 15, so as to fill out the middle harmony. The power version keeps the octaves, except for eighth notes, just including the C-sharp on the first beat. Both versions are reasonable. They both preserve the main lines and the harmony, although the secondary parts are slightly different. The following bars in measure 16 to 21 are the first 30 in the piece. The winds, including the horns, play in the poggiatura diminished seventh chord, while strings have a rhythmic motive on a repeated D. By definition, a piano reduction can't do two different timbres at the same time, so register and rhythm will have to serve to differentiate the two planes of tone here. The homo reduction simply fills out the chord in each hand, and has the lowest notes of the left hand do the eighth note rhythm. The power version puts the eighth notes in octaves. It's a bit harder to play, but a bit more convincing for a tutti passage. Note that the homo version leaves out the eighth notes in measure 19. When the opening comes back in measure 21-22, now there's added resonance in the oboes and bassoons, but both hands in the piano are already occupied with the melody and accompaniment, as at the beginning of the movement. So, what both piano versions do is to add long notes to the right hand, filling out the missing chords. It would be impractical to add all the doublings in the woodwinds, so the reductions only add two notes on the first beat, where the harmony changes. Now let's look at another tutti, measure 34 and following. This is a good example of the difference between orchestral thinking and keyboard figuration. Here, the main line is in the violins in octaves. The bass line is played by cellos and basses. The woodwind and the horns provide rich, sustained harmony in the background. Note that here, the violin line is below the upper woodwinds. It's still the foreground, so the piano version has to make it the top line. The harmony must again be compressed into the lower register with full chords in the left hand. Both reductions do this, but power, for some reason, lowers the left hand by an octave in measure 36. This acts a bit like a crescendo, although there is none indicated in the original. Starting in measure 38, the upper winds have a more independent plane of tone, harmonically complete on itself. Since the moving streamline is again in the same register, there is no alternative to making it the upper part. Both transcriptions simply fill in the harmony in the middle of the right hand to provide fullness. The piano pedal will also help to provide sustained resonance. To sum up, reductions always involve compromises. The key is to always have your oral priorities clear. Only if the person doing the transcription understands the composer's choices can they be made intelligently. As a general guide, the melody, bass line, and harmony should remain unchanged. The details of doubling, spacing, and figuration can be adjusted, provided they are done consistently and retain at least the same rhythmic values as the original, wherever possible. In the next lesson, we'll look at reducing some more complicated textures.